Hey, welcome to uh, Google Chicago. Uh, right now we have some amazing people here with us. Uh, my name is John Petrenko. I've been in specialty coffee for the last nine years or so. Um, and uh, again, I'm a huge fan of Intelligentsia, and I'm totally expecting some nervous energy here, but uh, <laughs> I would like to introduce our panel right now. Uh, to my right, we have James McLaughlin. He's the CEO and president of Intelligentsia Coffee. Uh, followed by Sam Sabori, uh, the National Roasting and Quality Control Manager. And then Michael Sheridan is the Director of Sourcing and Shared Value at Intelligentsia Coffee in Chicago. <laughs> so thank you for coming out to uh, Google Chicago. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Uh, we really want to get into all these questions and just like really kind of dive into what makes Intelligentsia like Amazing, because it is super amazing. I love it so much. I go there as much as possible. Um, uh, I, we just want to know what makes Intelligentsia Intelligentsia, and what makes you guys, uh, like where you guys came from to be where you're at today. Uh, so uh, to get into it right now, uh, this question is for all of you guys. Um, how did you guys get your start in coffee? And like, how did you become like, so successful in coffee? You want to start, Michael? Uh, I love the premise. Yeah. <laughs> How did become successful in coffee? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, we're big fans of Google, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I love this question, and it comes up a lot at coffee events, and I love it because usually people's story in coffee begins with something like, uh, well, I was a liberal arts major, or I was an art studies major. Uh, I, was a, I was a philosophy major, um, which, of course, means yeah. you're not qualified to to do anything, and so other than, than press buttons on a, on a coffee machine at Starbucks. Um, so a lot of people's coffee, uh, everybody comes to coffee from different places because there isn't sort of an academy. Um, we met last week the woman who runs uh, some of the food program here, and she went to the Culinary Institute of America. There isn't something like that for coffee. So people come from uh, all kinds of different places. I myself um, came from a, a really bizarre direction, which was international development. Um, about 20 years ago, as a volunteer in Central America, and I was placed in a coffee village, um, a coffee growing village. Uh, I was someone who was obsessed with coffee as a consumer. Um, and then uh, I just um, pursued it and found a way to work my way into coffee uh, through the channel of international development. Um, so a lot of people will start as, a, as baristas and try to find their way to where coffee is grown. I started where coffee was grown and found my way into places uh, where I work with baristas. Uh, I'm the arts major uh, stereotype. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I got into coffee in college as a barista. Uh, that sustained me through college. Uh, and then I got a job at a specialty shop, and I was kind of debating uh, further education. So grad school, or I really wasn't sure. So I decided to take a year to have fun with coffee. And then one year led to two, and two led to three. And then eventually I got a job at Intelli, and here I am 10 years later. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what Michael said. Thank you so much for having us. We're um, you, active users of many of your Google products. We love them all. Um, and we're neighbors, because we actually roast uh, probably six blocks west of here. So uh, it's really cool to be here and talk to you guys a little bit about coffee. Um, I'm the philosophy major of the group, um, but I took a, a somewhat unusual route to coffee. Um, I ended up practicing law here in Chicago for a number of years. I was a regular at Intelligentsia um, in Millennium Park. And um, in 2009, I quit my job, moved with my wife down to Brazil, and managed a coffee farm. Um, so I ran a coffee farm for three years um, and got the coffee bug and really decided that that was something I wanted to stay in. Um, we ended up moving back to the United States. And um, I, uh, I was a huge fan of Intelligentsia, just a true believer in what the company stood for, um, all the things that they were focused on, um, particularly at Origin. And I sent a cold letter to the company and said, hey, here's who I am. I'd love to come work for you. Um, and you know, one thing led to another, and here we are. Very cool, very cool. Now, about Intelligentsia, I'm curious, like, what is the inspiration behind Intelligentsia? Like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to like, specialty coffee? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, to answer it, I want to go back. I mean, coffee is um, one of the world's most widely traded commodities. And um, you know, when Intelligentsia was founded, um, 23 years ago, this idea of specialty coffee really didn't exist. I mean, there were people that were trying to do 
I, I, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, Pete's and Starbucks were, were sort of the, the second wave, what's commonly called the second wave of, of coffee, um, the upgrade from Folgers. And when, um, when Intelligentsia was founded 23 years ago, it was this idea that, hey, coffee can actually be something more. Um, we really need to treat coffee as a culinary product, um, much more, more so than Starbucks and Pete's were doing. Um, and it, it became, uh, I, I think, what, what Intelligentsia has always stood for is this idea that we want to keep the pristine ingredient that comes from the farm as pure and as intact and present that to our customers um, as possible. And that really gives us an opportunity to showcase all the different varietals and origins and all the different taste characteristics that I know you're super familiar with. Yeah. Um, and you know what? one of the things that we um, truly believe is that we have the opportunity to make change in the world through extraordinary coffee. I mean, when we talk about coffee at Intelligentsia, it is always extraordinary coffee because we are, we are buying, um, roasting, and serving the best coffee in the world. And we believe that um, really through our trading model, the way that we buy and sell coffees, um, we can have a huge impact on the communities um, in countries all across the world um, and give farmers an opportunity to make a, li a living and a livelihood um, that is totally disconnected from that commodity market that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so I, I think you know, it's, it's really about treating coffee as a culinary product um, that carries through in, I think, everything that we do. Um, at our coffee bars, you know, the, we, we were really one of, at the forefront of you know, introducing high design into coffee bars. Um, you know, if you go to our coffee bars, everyone is different. We, we try to design coffee bars for the specific neighborhood and make it feel like that customer, had, that's their coffee bar, that's their intelligentsia. It's not a cookie cutter model. Um, and so all these little details, um, you know, I like to say that if a customer knows nothing about intelligentsia and you walk into one of our shops, hopefully that customer stops as soon as they cross the door threshold and they say, wait, something's different. This doesn't feel like a common coffee shop. And that's, that's something that we want to have happen um, because we want to elevate the coffee experience to something culinary. Um, and it really carries through to all the small details. Um, you know, we don't have any cups, but like the cups that we use in our shops, that was stuff that we designed um, because we didn't like the way the cups felt in our hands, um, the ones that were commonly on the market. So we designed one where you had a place to rest your thumb. We designed the inside so that you could easily pour latte art. And again, the presentation was something that was different. Um, you know, another, another, I think, good example is, is the menu that we print every day at our shop. We get to pick the coffees we serve, and it's something different each and every day. Um, and it's this idea that, hey, coffee, coffee is not just coffee. There's coffee from Peru, there's coffee from El Salvador, there's coffee from Rwanda. And then there's 50 different levels below that um, that we're just really starting to scratch the surface. Totally. I mean, and that like leads to my next question. And this is just a like a, a coffee fanboy question. Like, like what is your favorite like coffee? What is your favorite process, region, and brewing technique? Like, you know, I love making like a Clita wave at home. Costa Rica is my favorite. I love a pulp natural. Like, uh, all all three of you guys like uh, I would really like to know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I honestly think you can make great coffee on any device. It's just how much time do you want to spend with it? Some are easier than others. Um, I. My personally, I kind of fluctuate between uh, a Chemex or, or a Kalita Wave. Uh, I tend to prefer smaller, smaller doses, so I'll usually dose around 22, 23 grams, right. and run a 1 to 18.25 ratio if you guys are interested. There you go. Uh, um, and as far as uh, favorite coffee, I would say Kenya is probably my favorite. It just has so much power. Uh, there's tons of sweetness, tons of acidity. And there's just so much to develop from a, from a roast perspective and a brewing perspective. Definitely. I don't want to go after that. <laughs> uh, 18.25 to 1. Um, I have a little less precision in my own habits. Um, I'll say that uh, in our office, the culture is to share. Um, to, we have a nice brew bar, and we've got every different kind of uh, manual brewing method available. Um, and so the Chemex tends to be my, my method of choice. And I bring it back and share it with my neighbors uh, where I sit. Um, it's a little bit unforgiving sometimes, hard to dial in. I've done a lot of more work with the Kalita lately. Um, but I just can't, anytime there's a, a fresh crop Ethiopia on the coffee bar, I can't pass it up. And we've got a couple that we're uh, brewing up for you here today, uh, including one that is just uh, incredibly floral and just endlessly sweet. And 
Um, for a lot of people, Ethiopia is uh, a challenging coffee because it doesn't taste like coffee. Um, it's very complex and it's got a lot going on. And for some people, it's not an everyday coffee. But um, if I could, if I could have one coffee on a desert island for the rest of my life, it would be the, the Ethiopian. Perfect. Yeah. I'd, I'd second that. I think a, a washed Ethiopian is probably my favorite, um, and I personally prefer the Chemex. But you know, I agree with Sam. You can make great coffee on anything. Um, but if I had to choose one, it would be Chemex. Chemex. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so this is for uh, Michael. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, can you tell us uh, about Intelligentsia's model on sourcing coffee? Yeah, I thought you'd never ask. Right. <laughs> um, I. I mentioned before that I got into coffee through international development. Um, and I, I, what I neglected to say was that I spent uh, 14 years with a, an international aid agency, and I spent 12 of those years working on coffee. Um, and it was kind of an interesting thing, because I was, I was living in Guatemala for four years and in South America for five years. And I was leading projects with thousands of smallholder coffee growers. Um, one of the things that's amazing about coffee from an impact perspective or a development perspective is that it's a poor person's crop. It's primarily grown by smallholder farmers who have maybe three or four or five acres. Um, so there's incredible developmental potential in coffee in general and specifically in our model. Um, but that's why a development agency was so deeply invested in coffee. But one of the nice things about that work was it was kind of like Switzerland. Um, we were totally neutral. And everybody is like, everybody in the coffee industry was like, oh, you're working on coffee to make coffee better and more impactful for smallholders. How can we help? And so people would fling open their doors. And I had, over those 12 years, the opportunity to work with uh, with, grower, with roasters of all shapes and sizes. And, um, and I'm going to. I think that Intelligentsia sourcing program is awesome, but it's not because I work for the company. I work for the company because I think the sourcing program is awesome. awesome. Um, as, I, as I did more and more of that work and I, I decided to make a move to the private sector, there were really very few companies that, from a developmental perspective, were interesting. And Intelligentsia was really at the top of the list. So um, we did get the questions for this in advance. So I did get to glance at it. And I made a long list of things that make our sourcing program awesome. I'm going to try to list, limit myself to like four or five here. I just hit them quickly. But um, I could go down to like 17 or 18 later if you're interested uh, when we're, uh, after we break. Um, the first thing I'll say about our program um, is, is our program is called Direct Trade. Uh, and it's, a, it's language, or it's a term that's used a lot in the industry now. But really, Intelligentsia developed the concept. Um, one of our colleagues, Jeff Watts, was sort of the primary intellectual and material author of the model. And the most important part about that is the direct part of direct trade. Um, and it's just what it sounds like. We visit every one of our direct trade partners every year on their farms, in their mills. And we work together to build the beautiful coffees that we serve in our coffee bars and that you, you'll try today. Um, and from a, from, a, from a sourcing perspective, I believe it's the most reliable way to get great coffee. Uh, from a developmental perspective, there's simply no substitute for sitting for a situation in which a buyer is sitting across the table from a grower and talking about what they're going to do together, how we're going to create quality, what kind of volumes we're going to work uh, we'll work on together this year, uh, what are the specific agronomic practices or post-harvest practices that can lead to quality, um, and there's just something magical magical about that face-to-face -face contact. Um, there are a lot of certification programs out there, um, fair trade, bird friendly, shade grown. Um, they're all good, but uh, for a lot of people, that is a way to outsource relationships. Uh, people do that because they don't visit the farms every year. Um, it's really fundamental to our model, and, and it's the way that we build quality. So direct is, d direct, the direct and direct trade is important. Um, the second thing I'll say is uh, that's, that's really important about the program is quality. Um, we believe that, uh, as James said, he mentioned the word culinary five or six times. It's such a bedrock belief of ours that, that coffee is a culinary product. And, um, it is a commodity, but not the coffee that we source, not the coffee that we serve, and not the way we think about coffee. We think about coffee as something elevated. Um, it's, a, it's a gastronomic uh, product, and the way we serve it is an elevated process. And we build our partnerships with that in mind. We find people who share our obsession with quality, and we build relationships with them um, that last. It's the, for us, we think it's the most, important, uh, the most important and effective way to be successful in the marketplace, and it turns out uh, the same thing is true for growers. The most reliable value proposition for a grower is to produce quality year after year. Um, the third thing is uh, the, way we, the way we trade coffee are our, our commercial contracts. And in order to understand what's special about the way we do it, um, you, you need to understand a little bit about the way the market normally works. And the, mar the way the market normally works is it's really intermediated. Coffee growers uh, rarely taste their own coffee. Um, they almost never meet 
coffee buyers. Um, they will sell their coffee to someone in the town plaza who will maybe resell it to a miller who will then export it. Um, and the two ends of the chain don't meet. Um, our, we build this, this model directly with growers. Um, and we build incentives for quality. It's not just the, that we pay more. We, we pay high prices. We pay stable prices. Um, normally, the prices that growers get, um, the market graph in coffee looks a little bit like a, like a seismograph or a polygraph test. Um, it looks like this. And it's very hard for a grower to make a living with, with prices that go up and down. Um, we pay stable, high, fixed prices so that growers know what they're going to make from us this year, what they're going to make next year, what they're going to make the year after that. And the growers in our supply chain have something that is, um, is a rare and, and beautiful thing, which is the ability to make plans for the future. Uh, and most growers are not in that, in that, in that position. So I'm going to stop there uh, at three. I, I, I could go on. Uh, but there is one more that I want to mention. It, um, it's called ECW. Um, one of the amazing things um, for us is that we, uh, we work with some of the, James said, we, we source and serve the best coffees in the world. And we work with some of the most celebrated coffee growers in the world. Um, in 10 countries around the world, there's a coffee competition every year called the, uh, the Cup of Excellence. And growers from all over the country will submit um, samples of their coffee. There's a national jury that will go through it three or four times. And they'll identify a, a small number of lots that qualify for the final jury. And then international cuppers come from all over the world. They sample the coffees. They grade them. And then they're sold at auction. Um, we have like a dozen different Cup of Excellence winners in our supply network. And um, it, we, we once a year get everybody in our supply chain network together for an event we call the Extraordinary Coffee Workshop. Uh, we just did our 10th annual one uh, last month in Bolivia. And when, when you get there, it's like the all-star game of coffee. It's like people are looking around the room. They're going, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's you. I, I know about your coffee. And you won Cup of Excellence in Honduras. And you won Cup of Excellence in, in Rwanda. Um, and we've been doing this now for 10 years. A lot of these people are people we've traded with for uh, 12 or 15 years. And they haven't just become friends with us, but they become friends with one another. Um, and so it's like a, it's sort of a part family reunion, part coffee uh, geek week, where we geek out on all the details of coffee agronomy and processing uh, and try to find little things that we can unlock to make our coffee better. Um, and that level of transparency and that level of exchange where the best in the world are, are learning from the best um, and we're facilitating it is something that just doesn't happen anywhere else in coffee. Um, so that, that's one of the most extraordinary things uh, that intelligentsia, intelligentsia does. And, and if, if I could just add, I mean, from the perspective of, of a grower, because I was a grower for, for a number of years, um, what, what Michael just described probably doesn't sound that, like, you know, that make, it all makes sense, right? You have a buyer sitting across from a seller. They were paying prices based on quality. Like, that all kind of makes sense intuitively. But the, the, the point that I want to emphasize is that that 15 years ago did not exist. Yeah. Everything, as Michael said, was traded, was all, all coffee was really traded through intermediaries. And so producers really had no idea where their coffee would end up going. And you had all these intermediaries throughout the process that were stepping on the product and making a little bit of money. And really, um, the, the brilliance of the direct trade model that, that Jeff really thought about was we're going to cut all those people out and, and push that value back to the producer. And that that really changes the game as a farmer, because you do have a partner that you know is coming back each and every year, and you can make smart business decisions. You can start thinking about it as a business. I'm going to save up my money, and I'm going to build a new wet mill, or I'm going to plant more land. Yeah. Um, and when you're really at the whim of the commodity market, and you don't know if the price is going to be high or low next year, you can't really run a business. You're really just trying to scrape by and make a living. Um, and I think. You know, I know that you know this really well, but it, it's, it's one of the best parts, I think, about working in coffee because you really do see the impact um, that our model is having in these communities with these farmers. Um, and you know, we carry that through to the end consumer. We, don't, we expect consumers to sort of share in um, paying higher prices um, because we're paying higher prices to the, the, the producers. But um, so far, consumers seem to be willing to, um, to, to, to sort of step with us in this. So um, I, I think it's some of this stuff sounds really intuitive, but it's such a radical departure for where coffee was 15 years ago. And I think it's important. It's, it wasn't just 15 years ago. I mean, it's, most of coffee is still traded that way today. That's true. And so the developmental work that I was doing in the field in southern Colombia, for example, um, with people who were coffee growers for 30 years 
And every year they'd go and they'd harvest and they'd put the coffee on a mule and they'd take it down to the town plaza and they'd sell it for whatever price was written on the slate there. And, it, and nothing had changed. And it had been like that for generations. Um, and then in, in that context, I would come in and I would bring, I brought, when I was working for the development agency, I brought Intelligentsia with me. Uh, just said, hey, explain your model. Oh, well, here's what we do, we do, here's what we look for, here's how we work, here's the prices we pay. Um, you know, here's the quality requirements we have. It's not easy. You know, you have to you have to be committed to quality with us. Um, is anybody interested in that? And everyone looked at each other like, is that a trick question? Of course, we're interested in that. It's fundamentally revolutionary um, in terms of that context. The other thing that James mentioned, James mentioned is the idea of cutting out the the intermediaries. We still do, um, in some cases, rely on intermediaries to do things like transport the coffee for us. But um, the key point is that that dialogue and getting back to where I started the idea of the direct part of direct trade. If you think about um, a traditional commodity ch chain, there may be um, six or eight different actors between the coffee bar and the grower. Um, and the traditional model is that those actors in the middle of the chain make money off of the growers. We're trying to make money together with the growers and to be competitive as a chain. But it's that, it's that even if we were, even in other chains where there's a collaborative spirit, where there isn't that direct contact, it's like a game of telephone. And you are all like educated people. You work for Google. You share a worldview. If we paid, um, you, you share some aspects of understanding how the world works. If we played a game of, of telephone in here, our messages, even a simple message, would break down. And if you think about a, a supply chain that reaches across multiple countries, multiple languages, different classes, um, it's very hard to convey clear messages. And so us closing the circle and being able to sit down with a grower and communicate directly, it's like for the grower, they, it's like going into an exam with the answers ahead of time. They know exactly what the market is demanding of them. There's no distortion of the market signal. It's direct. It's clear. And people can uh, make decisions and, and take decisions on the farm. Um, they have a much higher probability of success. And that's the idea of building quality together. That's so revolutionary about intelligentsia. Uh, there are a lot of people who serve quality coffee, um, but they're taking what emerges from a process that they have no control or influence over, whereas we're building the coffees every year from the ground up, beginning when the coffee is a seed um, and, and still on the plant. And, and one, one last point. I, I, <laughs> but uh, just, just to build on something Michael said, I think the, the other piece that's really important is the quality piece, because it's, it's easy for us to talk and say, you know, we, we can go to producers and say, we, you know, here's our quality expectations. But um, it's actually pretty hard to meet our quality expectations. I think, uh, you know, Sam can say this better than, I, I, I don't know the stats as well, but I think, you know, we got something like 3,000 samples that we received into our lab, right, to, to evaluate and decide whether we we're going to buy or not. Um, we select like 1% of those to actually buy. So um, it's, it's not easy to make the cut, which is, I think, your point about the all-star team. Um, but we're committed partners um, with the producers. And so if, if it often takes us four to five years working with a producer and saying, look, we believe in you. You, you have the right characteristics that we've found for you to be successful. We're going to help train you on what, how you produce quality coffee. Um, and often it takes four or five years before we'll actually get a container of coffee that we buy. Um, but it's something that, again, this idea that we're, we're partners in um, with the producers and the quality road is, is not easy. Right on. Nice. Well, next question I have is going to be for Sam. Uh, I'm very curious on, like, what do you look for in the roasting process? What's your philosophy in roasting and quality control with Intelligentsia? And follow up, what is your favorite coffee to roast? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we've, we've echoed it a few times, but uh, the sentiment that it's actually, like, it's, you approach it as if it's any other piece of food. Mm -hmm. um, you want to stabilize all your variables, uh, first and foremost, and that's where this direct trade model comes through. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but just having that streamlined communication between ourselves and the farmer to actually understand what's going on in the growing conditions, uh, going on on the farm, mm -hmm. I think that's key in playing a, a fundamental role in a, in a great roast. As far as the actual roast, uh, for us, it goes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, and we're stabilizing variables as often as possible. Uh, we, there are some roasters, some have a philosophy that you want to smell the coffee as you're roasting it. You want to take visual, uh, visual observations for us. Uh, we found that the roast goes so fast, it's really hard to actually consistently say that's the color, uh, whatever we want, you know, from, a, from a, an actual numbers perspective. Um, the way we will roast is we'll roast our coffees to a specific number on the, on the Maillard reaction. So depending on how brown it is, 
we are going to roast that to say uh, 55 or 60, and that's and we have specific parameters for each coffee that we want. Um, as far as the overall uh, big picture view for roasting, uh, we want a lot of momentum on our coffees. We want to roast them efficiently, and we want to roast them clean. If we roast them too slow, it's kind of like putting an egg on a frying pan that hasn't been preheated. It just kind of becomes kind of it just. You don't get that sizzle, you know? It just kind of sits there, it's flabby, you know you messed up, you know? Uh, so for us, we want to make sure with that momentum we can push our coffees as quickly as possible with continual reduction in heat. I don't know if that's, yeah. uh, that's about as roast. distilled as I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> and then favorite to roast. Favorite to roast? It'd probably be Kenya, that's probably why it's... Yeah. Uh, like a pea berry or just kind of... Uh, probably the double A's. Uh, so the, a Kenyan coffee, uh, they're classified based on their screen size, so based on how, how big or small each bean is, and each grade as it goes from AB to double A, AB or double A, or, or uh, lower grades, they just continue to get refined. So the double A, say that's one of the better mills, the better milling constructions that we can get, that allows us to be a lot more direct with our, with our approach, and it allows us to kind of push the coffees further. Whereas if, say, we were roasting a coffee that's borderline specialty, say not from Kenya, we might have to adjust our roast approach to slow down or speed up, because if we roast it at any other level, we're going to get vegetal notes, we're going to get sour notes, we're going to get uh, astringency. So a lot of times when you're tasting a coffee that's borderline specialty, the roaster is making a decision to take it that far because he's actually trying to minimize the negatives. Whereas with the Kenyan coffee, you can kind of keep pushing them to, to continue to expand the complexity. Okay, very cool. Um, another question is, uh, since you guys are founded in Chicago and we are in Google Chicago, uh, uh, you guys operate in many different cities. Uh, I'm wondering how you keep your Chicago identity um, while you keep expanding into other markets. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, when we go into new markets, we really try to um, become part of the community. And um, LA was the first city where we expanded into. Um, and I think, you know, I've heard anecdotally that, you know, there's a lot of people that think Intelligentsia is an LA brand. Um, and I, that, that's really part of what we want to do in each new city we, we've, we go into. Um, and you know, I think there's things, there's core things that we try to keep true across all of our coffee bars. I mean, quality is obviously the most important. Um, making sure that the, the coffee always tastes the way we want it to um, is fundamental, and it's probably the hardest thing. As we expand into new cities, making sure that we have the team and the people that can maintain our quality standards. Um, but from a, from a brand perspective, it's very much we want to become part of the neighborhoods. We want to become part of the communities. Um, I, I think it's probably no different than, than, than Google, you know, Google Chicago. Um, and so we try to find different ways to engage with the communities when we go into new cities um, and really become part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Very cool. What's your favorite uh, Chicago uh, intelligentsia? Yeah. Definitely the, the Monadnock location. Oh, okay. um, just the old school, it's in the, you know, the, that, that building was at one point the world's tallest building. Um, it, it's a completely um, brick structure, um, so it's not very tall. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think that's a great example of some of the, the design choices we make. We, you know, if you go into there, it's all marble countertops. Um, there's a brass bar. It feels old, modern but old, and it's sort of supposed to reflect that building and that architecture. So that would be my favorite one. Right. Anybody else? Uh, favorite favorite uh, cafe? I'd probably say Wicker because it's closest to my house. That's a fun one. Yeah, Wicker's on my route in. It's the Wicker. All right, very cool. Off-site conference room. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a fun one. I love that one. Um, so, uh, one thing is like with climate change affecting crop production and uh, farming all across the world. Um, how do you see coffee being affected by this crisis? And how do you see coffee going forward if these trends aren't reversed? Um, yeah, so climate change is um, a big deal <laughs> um, in every, in every uh, aspect of, uh, of, our, of our lives, and coffee is no exception. 
um, climate change is, uh, you know, the coffee is, uh, I've heard coffee described, I think, accurately as a Goldilocks crop. It uh, can't be too hot, it can't be too cold, it has to be just right. can't have too much rain, it can't have too little rain, it has to have just the right amount of rain. So it's uh, Arabica coffee, which is what we source, it's, uh, you know, the specialty coffee is uh, almost entirely Arabica. It's a very finicky crop, um, and it grows in the tropics uh, at a certain elevation range and, and has these requirements for temperature and, and rain, and those are getting uh, those are getting changed with, with climate change. And I think there's been a lot of research on this and the general tendency, uh, the general tendency that people see in coffee is that uh, the optimal elevation for coffee, the elevation range for coffee is rising as temperatures rise. So coffee likes the cool. Um, one of the things we look at when we source coffee is uh, the diurnal temperature range. So the difference between the high and the, in, the, in the midday and the low at night. Um, and the cool temperatures stress the plant and they contribute to the creation of these beautiful complex flavors. Um, and that cool, to get that kind of cool, you have to go higher and higher. And we know because of the nature of mountains, the higher you go, the less land is available. So coffee lands are, are going away uh, under a kind of a, a business as usual scenario. Um, and there's very little that a grower can do. Growers can mitigate the effects of that um, and sort of forestall that through their management practices by managing shade more intensively, lowering the ambient temperature of their, of their coffee groves. Uh, but ultimately, they're not going to be able to make the kinds of changes on the farm uh, to keep, keep up with climate change. So one of the very important sort of short-term things is working with growers um, to implement some of those things that will help to, to optimize the quality of their coffee. Um, but the long term, we require uh, more, more research. So um, all the staple crops that we consume, rice and corn and wheat, um, they all have publicly funded research institutes. So coffee um, as a cash crop does not. Um, and so the industry has been working together over the last five to 10 years to create a, a collective uh, research, uh, an industry-driven research agency. Uh, and they're, they're looking for the, sort of the holy grail. They're looking to, um, which is a combination of uh, Varieties that resist uh, difficult, they resist drought and disease, uh, and they produce a beautiful flavor in the cup. Generally, plant breeders are uh, just focused on productivity. They want to maximize yield, and they don't think about flavor. Um, there's a there's an organization that we've been supporting since its inception, since it was just in the concept phase. It's called World Coffee Research, um, and this is their pursuit to to uh, make uh, specialty coffee viable in, a, in an era of accelerated climate change. Um, and they're doing, they've done more in the last five to 10 years on plant breeding through partnerships with local research institutes throughout the coffee growing world um, than has been done sort of in the history of specialty leading up to it. And um, we contribute, we consider it part of our uh, cost of goods. We contribute a, a, a half a penny per pound for every pound of coffee that we buy um, to this research fund. James sits on the board um, as another part of our kind of belief in and commitment to this, this effort, um, and it's fundamental. Uh, but it's definitely changing things, and it, it, uh, it's changing the patterns of disease, changing cup profile. So, um, it's, and it's changing so fast that we we're so deeply engaged with our with our partners on the coffees that come in every year, and we're cupping them throughout their life span. Um, and so, we're working to give feedback and trying to uh, see you know, what what the changes are in the cup. Um, we're continuing to source amazing coffees. Um, yeah, but it's something that everybody uh, at every aspect, every step in the supply chain is working on. Um, so we're funding research. We're working at the farm level um, to deal with it. We're trying to promote um, water-saving technologies. But um, it's a challenge in coffee as it is in, in all of agriculture and every human endeavor, really. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, just two, two specific examples. Um, where I was um, living in Brazil, um, that region just came out of like the worst drought, they, they, had, they were in a two-year drought. Um, and um, many, many producers in the region where I was have abandoned their farms because um, the coffee trees died. And um, given that they're, most of these producers aren't focused on quality, there's really no future for them. Um, so it, it's given that it is mostly a smallholder crop, it's a huge risk to the industry as a whole. Um, the other example was, as Michael mentioned, the other problem with climate change is disease. Um, five years ago, four years ago, Central America, um, all the countries in Central America had an outbreak of a disease called leaf rust um, and really devastated um, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, um, and wiped out many, many farms. Um, and it's really a product of higher temperatures, you know, allows this um, fungus to um, breed more rapidly. Um, and 
as Michael mentioned, the, the future really is in plant breeding and figuring out how to create the super plant that can um, produce higher quality, resist disease, um, resist higher temperatures. But frankly, as an industry, we're pretty far behind in terms of that research. Um, and we're, there's, there's a lot of pressure to catch up quickly. Uh, I think we don't need to argue that technology and uh, the core of the internet has been pretty disruptive in the past two decades. How has it changed for your business? That and like social media and everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to take this in a couple different directions. Sure. Um, the first, I think, is in some ways, I think coffee um, hasn't changed much. I mean, if you, if you look at the roasters that we use today, they're the same roasters that we've used 80, 90 years ago. Um, there's some upgrades here and there, but overall it's like you apply heat to this metal drum, you, pit, you put green coffee in and it turns brown. Um, so in some ways, I think there's, there's frankly a, a huge opportunity for the industry to kind of catch up and figure out are there other ways to make coffee, to turn coffee brown. Um, so that, that, that's point number one. Um, there's pretty cool stuff that's happening though in terms of um, the ability to produce great tasting cups of coffee where it doesn't require a lot of manual work. Um, I mean, one of the things that we always talk about is when you think about all the different people that touch coffee in the supply chain, from the, the producer, their choices in the varietal, the picker, they choose which cherries they're going to put in the bill, in the bag, the miller, the um, dry, wet mill, the dry mill, um, the roaster, the barista, the end user. I mean, there's so many people that can affect how a cup of coffee tastes. Um, and we really, I, I think where we are going to go as an industry, where this industry is going, is that's going to get whittled down. Um, frankly, we have too many people that can affect the flavor and not really optimize it. Um, and I think what we're going to see over the next five or 10 years is the number of people that um, we're going to get coffee into consumers' hands in a finished good kind of way um, that actually tastes amazing. Um, in a better way than we do currently, right? Selling a consumer a bag of coffee is always terrifying for us because they take it home, they put it in their, bur their, their, uh, their grinder, um, they add too much water, they don't do 18.25 to one ratio. Um, and then they, they look at the bag and they say, gosh, why does Intelligentsia coffee not taste great? And it's like, no, but you didn't you know, do all these different things. Um, so I think there's, from a, from a um, technology standpoint, I think there's more from a brewing, roasting perspective that, that is starting to happen, but hasn't, hasn't really happened, hasn't caught up yet. Um, I, was, I was in Brazil. Um, I still buy coffee for Brazil for Intelligentsia, and I was on this farm, um, and they actually grow grapes there. And um, they have a, they're starting a, vin a, a winery. Um, and so we took, a, we took a, a day's picking of coffee, and we took it to the winery, and we used the winery's equipment to process the coffee. Like, super precise, super detailed. Um, we had this trained professional, you know, wine professional there consulting with us. And you don't see that in coffee today. It's still pretty rander, random and haphazard on the farm. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in terms of being more precise um, throughout the whole supply chain. I think to get to your second question, um, the great thing about social media and the internet is that it's given voices to smaller brands like Intelligentsia where we can actually reach more people in a way that we couldn't have you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and education is one of the most important things for a company like us. Why do you pay $22 for a bag of Tecorambesa from Ethiopia when there's a bag of Starbucks at the grocery store for $7. So what is different about Intelligentsia from Starbucks? It's both brown beans in a bag. Um, and it really gives us a chance to educate um, consumers about all the things we've been talking about today. Um, that, and then also educate consumers about how to brew the cup of coffee so it tastes good. Definitely, definitely. Um, one like kind of like a fanboy question I have is, uh, <laughs> like. You guys go out to origin. It's something I've always like really dreamed of doing. Just I think it would be amazing. Uh, I'm curious, like, what are your favorite trips of origin to go to, and maybe like a fun, crazy story that has happened while at origin. And for I think you got this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the story you want me to tell. <laughs> um, it's not always fun stuff that happens at origin. Sometimes crazy stuff happens that's not entirely fun. Um, well, I think it's certainly it's like. Uh, 
there's kind of this thing in coffee, and not everybody falls into the same pattern, but the, the principal entry point for coffee is, is as a barista. Um, like you just heard of Sam's experience, pretty common. Um, people, when, they, when they, they're a barista, and if it's just that they want benefits and pay for school and they're out, they're out, but a lot of people catch the bug and they get totally passionate about this thing that's endlessly complex and really fascinating, way more interesting than they ever thought it was when they were just trying to uh, pay some bills. Um, and they go down the rabbit hole, and the, the, generally the more people get interested in coffee, the more they get uh, interested in where it comes from and the people who grow it, and they want to get to origin. And so there's something kind of mythical about get, getting to take your first origin trip. It's sort of like a, land, a milestone in the professional development of, of serious coffee people. Um, and so there's no question it's, it's the highlight of the job. Um, all three of us here uh, buy coffee in addition to the work we do um, at the Roasting Works a couple of blocks from here. So. Um, the trips are things we look forward to, and we mm -hmm. take at least one a year, sometimes more than one, when we have a special project going on. Um, and we, we look forward to it. And uh, it's, it's a time where you cut through all the emails and the phone calls, and you just sit on the farm. And there's just something magical about being on a coffee farm. Um, I particularly love uh, shade-grown coffee, where you're outside in the tropical sun, and it's hot, maybe 70 degrees, but a really strong sun. And you step into the coffee grove, and the temperature drops like 12 degrees. And it's cool, and you feel the moisture, and you understand what the shade does for the coffee. Um, and, and then you're doing it you know, together with the grower, um, and it's great. And there's a lot of planning that goes into it. You talk about, hey, here's what we'd like to do together this year. Last year we bought this much. We'd like to buy a little more. Or we'd like to buy a little less. And we'd like to be more like this or less like that. So you do all this planning. Um, and then you go and you, you, you're you on the farm together. You're at the mill together, putting in place the plan. Um, what they want me to talk about is um, last year we did all this planning. <laughs> I made my first trip as the, the new coffee buyer in Bolivia. We this really exciting farm there. We're going to have uh, coffee from this farm in just a couple of weeks. Um, it's called Finca Takesi, and it's, it lays the claim to being the highest coffee farm in the world. And um, we've been buying coffee. We've bought coffee in 20 countries over the last 23 years, and we've never found a higher coffee farm. So uh, we, we have nothing to, uh, no evidence to suggest the claim is untrue. So for me, I was going to the highest coffee farm in the world. I was really excited. My first trip to Bolivia. Um, Bolivia is kind of um, a bit of a backwater country as far as, as far as anything goes. It's landlocked. It's very hard to get to. All the flights arrive at 3 a.m. Um, I wanted to save the company a couple of nickels, and I, I, I had a complicated itinerary that had two stops instead of one. And I went to the first stop on the first day, and I missed my connection. I had to wait a day, so I spent a night in Guatemala. Uh, and then I went the next day to Columbia, and I missed my connection there, so I had to spend a night in Columbia. So on the third day after leaving Chicago, I pull in at 3 a.m. To, to La Paz in Bolivia, and my partner picks us up, and we head out to the field. And we're about 10 minutes from the farm, and um, in the Bolivian Andes, these commanding Bolivian Andes, and the car flipped and rolled over once, twice, three, five or six times. And we dropped about 100 meters down the side of one of these big mountains. Um, and by some sort of miracle, we both emerged unscathed. Uh, but I, um, I'd had enough. I was mentally a little bit taxed, so I got on a nice flight home. So I spent five days on a sourcing trip, and I spent about 13 minutes on a farm, and then I was evacuated to go to a hospital in the capital. So it doesn't, all that hard planning, you know, it doesn't, careful planning doesn't always lead to success. Uh, but I was just there last month. Uh, no incidents. The coffee is beautiful and delicious. Uh, we, one of the things we do at our uh, ECW event is the last two years we've had a coffee competition, which is just awesome. So think about the all-star team of coffee, everybody bringing the best two kilos of coffee they can produce to the table. Sam roasts it. We all cup it. We qualify it. And then the growers themselves vote. Um, we have awards that are voted on by everybody in the supply chain. So they're tasting each other's coffees. They're looking around the room. They're all blindly uh, coated. So people are going, is this mine? Is that hers? Is it his? Whose is it? Um, and then we, we reveal the coffee. So this, this coffee from this farm um, was voted the best coffee in the Southern Hemisphere, best coffee in South America. Um, and we've got two bags of this coffee that are coming in, two 60 kilo bags that are coming in in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, we'll make a big deal about it when it, when it arrives, and it's going to be delicious. So uh, all, in the end, it will all have been worth it. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> well, I think we are about time for uh, to open up to a Q&A. Uh, so if anybody wants to ask a question, we'll have a microphone running around. So, uh, so you mentioned the three waves. What do you think is wave number four, if it comes? Uh, and what's the future of both coffee production, to your earlier question, and coffee consumption? Um, well, I'll start, and you guys can jump in. Um, 
I think we're going to continue to see, a, on the production side, I think we're going to continue to see a segregation of farms. Um, what, on, on the commodity side, what you're seeing uh, across the world is this move to massive, massive farms, um, primarily in Brazil and Vietnam, um, where all of the uh, work on the farm is being done mechanically. Um, and so that, I think, will continue to grow. Um, those farms are becoming so efficient that they can make money even when the market, the commodity market is at a dollar. Um, most farms, you know, I, I, I don't know if you have a stat. I, 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 for some reason, I want to think it's like, yeah, 140, 150 is kind of break even for most farmers. Um, and so I think you're going to continue to see that um, agribusiness grow um, for the commodity side. On the specialty side, I, I, and, and so that model is not sustainable for most smallholders. Um, the smallholder is never going to compete with the massive farm in Brazil that has huge tractors and everything else and all this money behind it. Um, so if the only hope, in my opinion, for the smallholder is to focus on quality and go the route of specialty. Um, that requires an investment. It requires time. It's not something that you just turn on overnight. Um, but I don't think there's going to be a middle ground. Either you're doing specialty coffee or you're in the commodity world. I don't, I just don't see a future for the small holder trying to produce commodity coffee. Um, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. I, I, I believe there's so much more complexity in coffee than we currently understand. Um, there's varietals, there's processing method, there's the stuff that Sam does with the roaster and the average consumer doesn't, still doesn't get it. Like, uh, there's so much more to for us to unlock for the consumer, and it's something that we talk a lot about: is how do we communicate the complexity of coffee, and how do we do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm the consumer? Um, and I don't know that we've totally figured it out. Um, we're trying, but I think over the next five to ten years, coffee is going to continue to go to the route of wine, where Consumers believe, you know, consumers start to say, "Wow, I really like the Catuai variety, processed in a washed method or a pulp natural method, and I really like Costa Rica." Um, you know, one of the things, one of the concepts that we've introduced at Intelligentsia is this idea of seasonality. Um, and so, if you go into one of our coffee bars, you'll see a sticker that says, "Some bags say it's in season," and the reason we do that is because what we have found is that one of the most important factors to freshness and taste is the number of days off of harvest. Everyone always talks about roast, and roast date's really important. Eh, it is, but it, it, I think we're missing a huge part of it, which is how, how old is it? How many days off of the harvest is it? And so there's really two buying seasons in the world. There's coffee from the northern hemisphere. It all harvests at more or less the same time. And countries in the southern hemisphere more or less harvest at the same time. And so we use, as a rule, nine months off of harvest. That's considered in season for us. And that's really where you're going to get the peak of flavors and freshness. And I use that as an example. I mean, that's just, again, we're just scratching the surface with this stuff. There's so much more complexity, as you know, mm -hmm. um, to coffee. And we, as an industry, I think, have to continue to push consumers to understand, hey, there's all these different variables that affect flavor. And we need to educate consumers around what coffees they like and then take them on a journey in their coffee life. You know, um, If you really like the uh, Pulp Natural from Brazil, that's great. We're going to kind of you know, introduce you there. Then we might take you to Peru. Then we might take you to Honduras. And then we might take you to East Africa. Um, there's really, I think, an evolution in most <coughs> consumers' coffee journeys, their, their lives. If I don't Yeah, I, I mean. I, I see both of those things. I think in the, at the at Origin, um, there there's going to be a consolidation where, where we have fewer and fewer growers of small, fewer and fewer smallholder growers, um, and that I think that we're going to get this really uh, bifurcated market with with com uh, commodity growers and then sort of craft growers really hyper focused on on quality, incorporating more technology and more precision. Um, in the marketplace side, I'm not sure if it's if it's what I believe will happen or what I just hope will happen. Um, but <laughs> one, one of the things that um, that has been, frankly, a little frustrating uh, for specialty coffee people, you know, we've talked. James has talked about this idea of coffee as culinary for us as a, as a core belief. But um, when I meet people who don't know what intelligentsia is, um, 
well, my first thing is to say, what? You don't, <laughs> um, we don't know what intelligence is. Um, but I try to explain it to people, like family members who don't know what I do. I say, well, it's, it's like a farm-to-table restaurant for coffee. And I think so much of what's exciting about and has been exciting about our food culture over the last 10 or 20 years, um, the idea, as James mentioned, of seasonality, of uh, relentless search for flavor, local ingredients, fresh ingredients, um, all of those things that make our food culture so exciting are, are really fundamental to the way we source coffee and w the way we try to position coffee in the marketplace. Um, and I feel like there has been, uh, coffee hasn't, we see ourselves very much as part of that movement. And in and, and, and some senses, the work that we've done in, in, in our sourcing um, predates a lot of the work that's been done um, in food. Uh, but we haven't sort of been mapped into that. And so we talk a lot about wine and coffee. And I think it's probably a case of envy uh, where we want to be more like wine. But we, we think it's, it's, it's instructive and it's important in a lot of ways. Uh, chemically, coffee is more complex than wine. Um, it has the same kind of things that you think about wine, uh, a vintage. Well, every, you know, every year, Finca Takesi produces a geisha varietal that's somewhat different from the previous year. And it depends on all the things that affect the, the, you know, the vintages of wine. Um, so there's a lot of really good analogies there. And I think um, co coffee, to, to James's point about coffee's complexity being underappreciated, um, we feel like coffee's time is coming in terms of being really appreciated as the culinary product that it is. Uh, and we're, as James said, we're also searching for our, our role in trying to help people appreciate that and, and move, help move uh, uh, specialty to that, to that moment. I hope that's in our future. Yeah, definitely. So with the wine analogy, I was kind of thinking about when coffee has its sideways moment. You know how that, that movie one came out. So, um, but no, my, my question was more about, you know, so the thing I've sort of noticed and I've commented when I, so I live in Lakeview and I go to Lakeview uh, Cafe and um, I noticed if you mentioned it, I love it. And it's, um, it's I, I, I feel a lot more like it's an experiential thing when I go there. Like it feels much more curated, not just the selection, but also like, like I feel myself approaching a little differently. Um, and like I have a spouse who steadfastly refuses to drink coffee. He won't touch it. It frustrates the hell out of me because I'm like, there's so many things you're missing, right? And then I also have friends who are like, I go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a buzz on. And 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 so like, how does that how does that sort of spectrum like how do you, like how do I make my friends into coffee snobs? No, how do you <laughs> how do you view the sort of experiential bent that intelligentsia occupies sort of in that that niche in the market? And and how do you kind of expand that if you're talking about complexity? when a lot of people don't necessarily notice it. Is there like a sideways moment that you think the industry needs? Are you driving that? Is the suppliers driving that? Are like small neighborhood places going to drive that? How do you see that happening? Yeah, I, I, I think to answer at least part of your question, um, right, we have this belief that coffee should be treated as a culinary product. And so if, if we um, emulated the, the traditional sort of fast food model, I don't think we could have gotten to where we have today. And so part of it is we, we have to do something different for customers to come in and say, yeah, I'm OK paying $6 for a black cup of coffee, even though I can go down the street to Dunkin' Donuts and get it for $2. Um, so the, ex the, the having a, an experience, a complete experience for customers, I think is really important for us as a brand. Um, we don't have an interest in having 5,000 intelligentsias around Chicago or around the United States. Like we, we want to keep this pretty boutique and um, grow the brand through the, through, through the coffee bar experience, but then it's available in a lot of different places, at your Whole Foods, at your, um, at your office, um, wherever it may be. Um, but you know, one thing that we struggle with is not everyone wants to wait six minutes for a pour over. And, you know, particularly at our downtown locations, um, it's something that we talk about a lot. How do we meet customers where they want a great cup of coffee, they're not willing to wait six minutes? Um, and it's, it's something that, candidly, we struggle with because we don't want it to become fast foody, right? Like too much like a fast food experience because then we lose the credibility around, hey, this is a culinary experience. Um, but at the same time, if there's customers that want to come in and get a great cup of coffee but get it quickly, we want to serve them too. And I think one of the things that, that we, one of the cool parts of getting to design a coffee bar every time we open one, uh, it's both maddening and cool um, because it's like, okay, we got to start from scratch again. We don't have this cookie cutter template. 
but we do get to experiment with service models. And so um, I'll give you an example, like our Logan Square shop here in Chicago, right? A barista comes over, you sit at the bar, the barista will wait on you. Um, you can engage, the baristas are, will kind of read the customer and, and try to figure out how much they want to engage about the coffee. Like, do they want to talk about the coffee? Are they just here for, you know, they just want the, the, the cup of coffee and leave me alone, I just woke up. Um, so there's that experience, but then you can also, at the front of the bar, you can get a coffee to go, and it's, it should be a faster experience. And so I, I can't say that we've cracked that nut, um, but it's definitely something that we're trying, we're still trying to figure out. And I, I um, because I, I want to, I mean, one of the things we all want to do is introduce more people, your wife, your friends, to this cup of coffee, because I, I think once you try it, you're hooked, and it's hard to go back to the Dunkin' Donuts. I think also we, it should be said that we, um, we, our obsession with quality, we, we have a lighter pro, roast profile than, than, than most. Um, and that really is not by accident. I mean, I think a lot of, it, it's a reflection of the quality of the, the coffee that we source. Um, one of my colleagues recently put it so well, I think for a, a non-coffee person, he, he was saying that um, if you get a beautiful piece of tuna that's sushi grade, you don't even have to cook it. You can just eat it. Um, but if you get a, an old piece of tuna that's like not the best cut, you got to cook it for a long time to make it palatable. Um, and it's sort of like that with coffee. We're, we're sourcing some of the world's finest coffee. Uh, you don't need to layer on all of that caramelization and that um, all that bitterness that you get in the deep dark roast. Um, you can create something really beautiful by laying, letting your foot off the gas and, and, and letting it uh, breathe at a, at a lighter roast profile. Um, so we, we tend to regard um, the really dark you know, like carbonated, carbonized um, coffee as um, not culinary. You know, it, you're not tasting the terroir, you're not tasting the work, you're tasting the hand of the roaster, you're tasting the, um, and so, you know, we, we, most of us who are coffee professionals don't reach, in, the, in intelligentsia, we don't reach for the dark roast. But even our dark roast, we try to reimagine the dark roast for uh, a kind of a specialty audience. So um, we, our, our dark roast, if you put it next to a, you know, uh, brand who shall not be mentioned, um, they, they're just on, they're occupying different planets. Um, and so I think to, to your point, like meeting people where they are and this idea of a journey and trying to help people discover coffee, um, we, we want to have a dark roast that's, hey, try this as a, you know, reimagine your dark roast. It doesn't have to be just like uh, an ashtray. You know, th there's some nuance <laughs> there, there's some citrus, there's some sweetness, um, but you're still getting that slight little bite and um, and, and something that uh, you go, oh, this is a, a different kind of thing. So, and I think it, it should be said, as I look at three different tap systems in the back of the room, um, part of the future of coffee is coffee as an ingredient, um, and, and coffee as an ingredient in, in, the, in the broader beverage market. Um, and so I think you know, we can look down our nose at some of those things, or we can say, hey, this is an opportunity to engage people and meet them where they are and where they're, where they're having coffee with a product that's superior um, and, and try to bring them into a deeper appreciation for everything that companies like ours do. Cool. Yeah, I think that uh, that sideways moment is going to come when everybody understands seasonality, and it's going to be, I'm not drinking any past crop coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, if anything, anything that we can really, really push is that seasonality to say, if, you can, if you're going to any cafe and you order what's fresh, we found the freshest coffees tend to perform better, whether or not the roast is as ideal as or or a little bit off. So there's that. And I think that's kind of touching on the fourth wave also is when the customer understands what we're trying to do, I think that's where fourth wave, when we're meeting the customer and they're coming to us willing to pay $10, 15 because I think that's already out there. It's just very small, very small companies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, I believe we're out of time. I would like to thank uh, James, Sam, and Michael again, and the whole Intelligentsia team for coming out to Google. Uh, this has been great. Come feel free to bother us uh, after this. And I believe there will be coffee cocktails and some coffee demos coming up soon. So uh, uh, let's give a round of applause for our guests. <laughs>